Park, a location over in Riverside, none other than our friend and, and, and my assistant, hey, Rick Tatina. But it's hard to learn another language when you don't know the language that you're trying to speak in. Amen. And there are people that teach something called English as a second language. Yes. Which actually, they don't even know the receptor or the receiving language that they're preaching to or that they're talking to. And what they do is they use different signs and different uh, abilities to communicate small things as they build on those small things and become greater. And so one of the things they do is they say, hello, and they wave their hand, and they repeat it, and they say, hello. And the person that doesn't know English and doesn't know any other language that the person telling them hello to learns that this means hello. Amen. Or they do other things, they use body language, so they can see that someone is saying, sit down. So they sit down and stand up. Mm -hmm. They tell us that means stand up. So they start learning the basic building blocks of the English language, even though there's been no translation given to them. And that's pretty fascinating because how do you do that? How do you use abilities and different techniques to help others get a grasp of that language? Amen. It's the same thing that we're going to learn today the scripture. And that is how to make sure your gifts are building up the church body. Amen. How to make sure the gifts that God has given to you, when you put your faith in Him, are building a building that consists of people all around you. And so we want to take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14. If you have your Bible, you can turn there. 1 Corinthians 14, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians. And so chapter 14 is an interesting chapter. There's a lot in the world. We're going to take precepts out of there. And so the first thing we learn about making sure our gifts are building up the church is we need to pursue the gifts that maximize the greatest understanding. Mm -hmm. We need to search after and follow after the spiritual gifts that bring the greatest clear message to someone else who's going to experience that gift along with you. Mm -hmm. And in the context of the court, they had some struggles with this. They were very immature. They were very selfish. They were using their spiritual gifts to benefit themselves only, and they were not using them to benefit others. And that turned into divisions. They had divisions of people within the church. And so even to the point where they would take the Lord's Supper, other people would go first, and people after them would be disregarded. Mm -hmm. That is not how God intended us to take the Lord's Supper. Well, yes. And so we're pursuing the gifts that maximize the greatest understanding. Let's look at verses 1 through 5. Pursue love, yet earnestly desire spiritual gifts, but especially that they may prophesy. Mm -hmm. For one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. Mm -hmm. For no one understands, but in his spirit he speaks mysteries. But one who prophesies speaks to men for edification and exhortation and consolation. One who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but one who prophesies edifies the church. Mm -hmm. Now I wish that you all spoke in tongues, but even more that you would prophesy. And greater is the one who prophesies than the one who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets so that the church may receive edification. Mm -hmm. So this is the illustration of maximizing the gift of prophecy in tongues. So he tells you before anything else comes out of your mouth, whether it's speaking in tongues, and speaking in tongues in the Bible is ecstatic or mysterious heavenly language that the Spirit of God gives someone to say. And that person who's saying it does not know what the words are being said. They don't know what they mean. But there has to be some kind of interpretation to it. And so the first thing he says was, make sure you're pursuing and following after love. Make sure you're following after love which is a high regard for someone else. Mm -hmm. 
before you start thinking about what spiritual gift I'm going to use today, or what time I'm going to use them today. Man, what is higher than pursuing spiritual gifts? But he doesn't want to get rid of the spiritual gifts and throw the baby out with the bad part and wants us to keep them there as a high priority. And so he says, earnestly desire to be spiritual gifts have a strong passion about your heart, but especially prophecy. Mm-hmm. And what is prophecy? Prophecy is various things in the Bible. It's coming forth God's word, but it's also coming forth the future. And in this case, it's telling forth some kind of behavior or encouragement that only the person who's receiving the prophecy or the group of people that are receiving the prophecy know. And the person speaking it does not know. It comes from God. Amen. So it's speaking forth God's message. And we should desire a prophecy more than the rest. Mm-hmm. Because, and here's the reason. Because its effectiveness is greater. It is a greater gift in some sense. It is a greater gift to communicate a message from God to everyone than to just enjoy the experience of speaking a language that you don't know, given by the Spirit of God, that no one else can understand. Amen. And so he says, whoever speaks in the tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands, but in his spirit he speaks these mysteries. But the one who speaks for God's message of prophecy speaks to men for building up, for edification, for exhortation, which is support or uh, stimulating or motivation to do something, or consolation, which is comforting. Mm-hmm. And so he desires, the spirit of the God desires to build us up. Yeah. To support us mm-hmm. and to cause us to be comforted. Wow. He's called the comforter, isn't he? Yes, he yeah. is. And so he wants, above all things, any spiritual gift that you have. And you may not even know your spiritual gift. You have one, or at least one, if you can put your faith in Jesus Christ. But if you have not, you don't have a spiritual gift yet. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. But the one who speaks in the tongue, he only edifies himself. And the word edify has to do with building up, or building a, a building or a structure. And so, when you're speaking in tongues, if it only stays between you and God, then it only builds up yourself and does the best blessing in the house. Mm-hmm. But, the one who prophesies edifies the congregation. Amen. Amen. Tongues has limited reach and blessing if it remains uninterpreted, but it builds up and strengthens those who receive the message in the language itself. Mm-hmm. It's a mysterious utterance from heavenly origin, but when it's translated, it blesses us with wisdom and knowledge that we need. Amen. Now I wish that you all spoke in tongues. Why would he say he wants to speak in tongues? Because tongues is a good prophecy. Because if tongues is interpreted, it functions in the same way as prophecy, as a message from God to his people. So unless he interprets so that the church can be built up, interpreted tongues functions just as like prophecy. Tongues itself prophesies, prophets only the tongue speaker unless it's interpreted. So make sure your gift is profitable for others. Make sure your gift is profitable for others. Make sure your home doesn't make your church. So pursue the gift that has now, have you ever heard of seen that show where they have those extreme coupon ladies that go around these stores? I don't really know the show, but I watched a little bit of it once, and here's a lady with like two grocery baskets full of food and items that she picked up at a grocery store. And yet when she gets into the line to pay for it, she brings out a stack of paper clippings and cut out coupons that she got to put forth for the cashier. And what she does is she gives the cashier the coupons, and you watch the balance, which says two hundred and eighty-four dollars and fifteen cents, go down to like thirty-eight cents. So she buys hundred plus items from the store, but because she did the diligent work with the coupons, she's able to pay less than a dollar. Amen. Did she not maximize her purchase power with those coupons? Right. It's fascinating to watch. And that's what we need to do with our spiritual gifts. We need to maximize them so that they gave people the best understanding, the best mental knowledge and direction in their lives so that they can 
follow God. When you pray for someone, that's how you pray for someone. Be open to God giving you a divine uh, insight or some kind of vision for that person. Maybe take a little pause in your prayer. Just wait and get a Holy Spirit wants to tell you something. Just pray for them or tell you something to tell them. And maybe you do have a spiritual gift of tongues. Maybe you have it. Maybe sometimes you start praying and it's some words will come and you don't even know what they are. And you know what we learn through pastor is that when you have that and there's a group of people around, you want to check the house. Mm -hmm. You want to check to yeah. see if maybe someone got an interpretation for that. Amen. Amen. Maybe someone got a message for that. Or if it's just you, maybe it's the last thing that came to your mind. The scripture or some kind of guidance that came to your mind at the end of your talk speaking that could be the message for the other person or group. And so we need to pursue the gifts that that time to greatest understanding. But the second thing is we need to know the significance of our gifts for both insiders and outsiders. This is uh, important in the Bible as well. The first thing you have to do with the vertical, the tongues between God and man, and the horizontal between man and someone else. Now let's look at the significance of our gifts. Because they benefit believers and unbelievers in different ways. Okay. Look at verse 20 through 25. Brother, do not be children in your thinking, yet the evil be infants. But in your thinking be mature. In the law it is written, by men of strange tongues, by the lips of strangers, I will speak to this people, and even so they will not listen to me, says the Lord. So men talk are called a sign, not to those who believe, but to the unbelievers. But prophecy is a sign for not for unbelievers, but to those who believe. Therefore, if the whole church is assembled together, and everyone speaks in tongues, the ungifted man or an unbeliever enters the room, will they not say that they were crazy? But if everyone prophesies, and an unbeliever or an ungifted man enters the room, he is convicted by all, and he is called to account by everyone. Because the secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so he will fall on his face and worship God, declaring that God is truly in your midst. Amen. So that is knowing the significance of the gifts for both insiders and outsiders. One thing we need to know, and the pastor has said this recently, is are we under teaching each other? Is the church as a whole under teaching its people? Why do we not have that mature understanding in our minds to know what the Word of God says? Mm -hmm. It's our food. Like He said, it's our feast. Yeah. And we have to take it in daily. And so he says, don't be children in your thinking. You should be, you should be in your 60s and 70s in your thinking. You should be really mature and have knowledge and wisdom that you can use and apply to people and yourself in any kind of situation that arises. But as regards to doing evil, you should be so uh, young and you don't even know how to do it. Some, most of our children don't even know what some of the sins are we know, right? Amen. Our children don't know what, what the sake is and different things like that. And we need to tell you what it is. That's how we should be in regards to evil. We should not really have the knowledge or experience of it. Because we're so mature, our thinking is leading us to go down right path, not wrong. Amen. So Paul calls us to mature thinking and the use of it, our minds. Amen. But he says tongues are for unbelievers. Why are tongues for unbelievers? Don't they benefit believers? Yes. They benefit believers when they're interpreted, or if they're not interpreted, they benefit the person speaking in tongue. But in this case, he refers to an Old Testament passage that says, By men of strange tongues, and by the lips of strangers, I will speak to this people, and even so they will not listen to me. The context of that passage is that the children of Israel, whom God had chosen and brought out of slavery, would not listen to him no matter what he tried to do. He sent prophet after prophet after prophet to his people, and they would not listen. And so he sends people from a different language to speak to the children of Israel. And he uses it as a tool of judgment to say, you guys can listen to me, therefore I will speak so you can understand me. Mm -hmm. I will speak so it's not clear. You won't understand me because you don't want to understand me. That's right, man. 
And that's, that's a sign of judgment on people who do not believe in Jesus Christ and have repented of their sin and put their faith in Him for salvation. And so it comes to sign to say, wow, I don't understand what's going on. Maybe I'm on the outside. Maybe I'm on the outside. We need to be on the inside. But for believers, for those who do believe and continually commit their way to Jesus Christ, it says, prophecy is a sign for those who believe. But wait, how is prophecy a sign for those who believe? If prophecy is a thing that convicts us. See, the idea is that someone will speak the word of prophecy, and it will come forth. Maybe they will do it in the pulpit. And what it will do is we'll speak something specifically to someone in the audience who is really not on the path of God. And what it will do is it will convict them in their hearts, causing them to feel like, wow, God is speaking to me. God is speaking directly to me. That's how they are speaking to me. That's God. And it will come down in the front and they'll put their hands in and knees out of the ground and say, God is here. And they'll repent of their sins. And as one person put it, the prophecy is a fast track to repentance. My love. Amen. And so what happens is when we see prophecy executed, it's a sign for us to believe, to show us that God has favor on us. It's a sign to say, yes, that person was convicted and they repented. It's a sign to show us that God is pleased with our, our congregation. Amen. He's pleased with the Catholic Mm-hmm. And so he says, that is prophecy. The point of prophecy is to acknowledge God and give allegiance to Him by repenting. So an illustration of that would be the statue called the Fountain of Time. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of the Fountain of Time? On the south side of Chicago the University of Chicago, there's this big sculpture. That and it looks just like that. That's it. And if you look at it, you might be like, oh, I, I can figure out what that means. It's, you know, it's a bunch of people, it's kind of shaped in an arc, and there's a guy in the back, maybe he's representing God, and he's watching over us, and that's great, you know, I'm going to walk by, I'm on the way to Starbucks. Well, that's not the case. The, the sculpture is more significant than that. It actually based upon a poem written by a man many years ago, and it was sculpted in 1920. And the meaning of the sculpture is that there's time is like the father of us all. And Father Time looks at history and he sees people born, he sees people struggle through life, he sees people go through heartaches, headaches, through wars, through famines, through love, finding God and, and, and Christ. And he sees the cross, his cross of history. But it also means that we go not time. Time is always here. We come and go, but time stays and watches over everything. And so that's the meaning of it. And if you want to see it, it is not that far from here. You can take it from there and explain the meaning of that time. But you don't know the significance unless you write a story about it. It's a significant thing to look at, but if you know the meaning, it'll help you better understand what you should take away from it. And that's the idea behind this passage is that you need to know the significance of tongues or other meanings as a sign of judgment. And we need to know the significance of prophecy speaking forth revelatory uh, things to believers and unbelievers as a sign of favor of God. Amen. And so you should be encouraged when you see someone prophesy. When you see someone prophesy out here, when you see someone uh, give, their God, give their life to God, that should be an encouragement to you. God is the one acting in that. Hallelujah. Don't say for what God does. Amen. And let's move to the last point. Avoid confusion by being both spontaneous and ordered. We need to avoid getting all wrapped up in disarray by having the Spirit of God move whenever He wants in this instance, but also being ordered and not just relying on the Spirit to us anywhere. He works in orderly fashion. Let's look at verses uh, 29 through 40. Let two or three prophets speak, and let the others pass judgment or discern. But if the revelation is made to another person who is seated, the first one must keep silent. Just a reminder, there are instructions during the church service for the people at court and the others. For everyone may prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and be exhorted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, 
as in all the churches of the saints. The women are to keep silent for the churches, for they are not permitted to see, but are subject to themselves, just as the law also says. If they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is proper for a woman to speak in church. Was it from you that the word of God first came forth, or has it come to you only? If anyone thinks he is a prophet or a spiritual person, let him recognize that the things which I write to you are the Lord's commandments. But if anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. Therefore, my brethren, earnestly desire to prophesy, and do not forbid speaking in tongues. But in all things, let them be done in a decent and orderly fashion, or properly in an orderly manner. These are the words from God through Paul. And so we need to avoid confusion during the church, during the small group setting, wherever they are, by means of letting the Spirit of God move in the way He wants to. Maybe He wants to say something to a specific person or a visitor to this song. And you can add in a worthy fashion. So He says that two or three prophets He sees when we're in our church service, they only have two or three people come forward and say, I have a message from the Lord, a word from the Lord. And they will speak it forth. But they didn't just let it go forth. And this is what we do here as well. If someone is saying something and they say something very questionable, we have elders and leaders here who can get up and give a discerning word on that. Maybe they want to redirect that message another way because they don't feel like it's in God. And so prophecy should be discerned. It should be uh, given thought and wisdom and prayer and ask to be received by God. But also, Maybe someone else will get a revelation that they want to see. That first prophet needs to stop speaking and sit down and let the next person go. Notice he's having an orderly manner about the service. Because he knows that the Spirit of God is not uncontrollable. If the Spirit of God is moving in you, you have control to some extent about when you can open your mouth and when not. So no one can blame on the Spirit of God. That's right. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. God wants harmony between people. And He wants harmony in His church services. Amen. But He says this, this is the controversial passage of the day. Women are to keep silent in the churches, so they are not permitted to speak, but are to subject themselves, just as the law also says. If they desire to learn anything, ask other extra responses at home. For it is impossible for a woman to improper for a woman to see the church. Now, what that means, as far as I understand it, is that during the prophetic announcements that came forth from prophets, they wanted women to not interact with the prophet. Especially culturally, there was a lot going on in that church setting. They were very loose with their morals. And they had some people say they were kind of like Las Vegas, the church of Las Vegas. They loved Christ, but they still had a lot of sin going on. And so they, Paul is trying to get them on the racks, bring them around uh, uh, orderly fashion, but also keep the Spirit of God there. So when the prophets were speaking for, they didn't want any woman to interact with that person, especially if he was married. And in that culture, uh, you didn't generally speak to a man who was married if you were married as well. So it's kind of a cultural, uh, shamefully thing to do for a married woman to address another man, especially in public. So he says, let them, they can prophesy because in 1 Corinthians earlier, Paul says that women prophesy. And even in other places in the Bible, they can prophesy as well. And they pray during the church services. So God speaks to women as he does to men. But in the sense of discerning the prophecy that go forth during the church setting, he wants men to be most to discern. And Paul wrote, he expects some disagreement on this issue. So he says, was it from you that the word of God first came The court, the Corinthians were not the ones who brought the message to others. It was Paul and his small group that brought the message to the Corinthians. And he's the apostle. They should listen to him, is what he's saying. If anyone thinks he is a prophet or a spiritual, let him recognize that the things which I write to you are from the Lord. So Paul is saying, I have the Lord's authority when I'm telling you these things, written in this letter. It should make us look at this book, this Bible, as something coming from God. I want God to speak to you. I want to hear from God. I want to be close to God. He's speaking. He's right here speaking. Amen. This is one of the ways. This is the main way. But if anyone does not recognize what Paul says about these things, he is not recognized. 
He is not at the status of speaking as an apostle. Therefore, brothers, here's the conclusion of this message. Desire to prophesy earnestly, passionately, desire to hear from God. But do not believe people to see in tongues. Don't stop all the tongues. Because the idea was to take Paul's uh, word of correction too far. And to say, okay, no more tongues speaking. We won't have any of that because that will not sell at all. No, that's not what he wants to do. He wants to be used in a wise fashion and with order. Amen. Because everything must be done properly and in order in man. It's if we were to take tongues out of it, we would be cut off the arm of the Holy Spirit when we overreacted to the word of God. Amen. We're not going to get the story here. This group of men that were slaves that were buried at this whole time. And this one guy, I think he really just wanted to get married. And he saw this lady, and he, they were you know, having a good time, and he went up to her and just kissed her out of nowhere. And what would you do with some random guy that's going to be busy if you're not married, of course? You know, I don't know what he did, but what happened was he started a small relationship with this man, which continued on. And if you read their story, down the line, the, the, the girl takes him to his country, which was Kilo. And she takes him there and says, you know what? This is the place where you were born, and this is where your parents live, and I just wanted to be here because it's going to be these great memories, and I thought it would mean a lot to you. And he says, you know, it means a lot to me, but it would mean more, than, more to me if you would marry me. And he got down and proposed to her. And she said, yes. And you know, that's a fascinating story because it started out with a spontaneous kiss by some stranger. And it led to something that was ordered and it set the range in a certain way of marriage and having a ceremony and having a family day there and everything to draw the conclusion that it's a good thing. But it has a spontaneity to it, suddenness to it. And that's how the Spirit of God will work in our church. Maybe you're in charge of a small group, or you're in charge of a service. Maybe you're coming to the church and you're in charge of a service. Leave some room for the Spirit of God to do something. Our agenda our says the above schedule is subject to the change according to the move of the Spirit of God. Amen. So we've got all these things here call the Lord, praise and worship, open the scriptures, the scriptures, praise and worship, all the announcements, quote and prayer song, proceeding, praise and worship. Holy Spirit stops us. My turn. He wants to get in there. You don't just run around, Holy Spirit move, Holy Spirit move again, Holy Spirit move third time. No, you gotta do things, you gotta read the scriptures, you gotta follow what the Word of God says about having the church service in a certain fashion. But you just need to be open for Him to move. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we need to carve out time for Him to move in our lives. Yes. And I want to close with this. The Holy Spirit is speaking. He's speaking to us. And He has some language. Most of the time, the things we get in our minds and an insight, by the time we work for someone else, that, that's why we have to you. Or a scripture that hits you, something that's magnified above everything else that you hear. That could be the Spirit of God. I would be scared of that and pray about that. And God would give you wisdom. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your give us instruction about how to order our service around the spontaneity of the Holy Spirit. We pray that anyone here does not have faith in Jesus Christ, which we have seen in the baptism, God. We see that through baptism, we bury our own flesh. We say no one living life of sin directed by ourselves, and we give it up to Jesus Christ because He gave up His life for us. We just pray that each one of us will go away from this place with a new life and a new heart. In Jesus' name, amen.